Gentili ospiti, benvenuti. Il Festival Internazionale dell'Economia vorrebbe conoscere la vostra opinione. Gentlemen, welcome. We would like to know your opinion. Please fill out the QR, scan the QR code and fill out the questionnaire to give us your opinion. Thank you. Oh, good evening, everyone. I think there's a microphone problem. Without a microphone. Yeah. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight. I apologize if it's warm, but our president, our chairman, did not turn the air conditioning on. You're trying to save, aren't you? My name is Francesco Profumo. I'm the chairman of San Paolo, Compagnia di San Paolo. I'm very happy of this. Uh, evening together. Well, first of all, because you are in the week of the International Festival of Economics. And I believe every each one of you has uh, had the opportunity to discover Turin uh, because it's something special. While walking on the street, uh, I meet people that ask him, uh, where can I go and follow a lesson? There's a lot of young people around. It's so beautiful. And this is clearly a way to create culture. It's the being able to change economics in a fest international festival of economics is not uh, a bad idea. It's, it's complicated concepts, and I think our country needs more economic culture. And I am very, I put a lot of attention to this, and I think that these festivals have give uh, this opportunity to uh, put many people together who can face each other and discuss together complicated topics in, a, in the simplest of ways so that it can be shared. So why we decided to have a, a special division here at the Collegio? Why? Because the, this uh, Collegio was uh, established in Moncalieri, in the Moncalieri College where many, many people from Turin had studied. It was an ex excellent research center, but it had some problem in becoming an aggregation point, as we could say today, a think tank that could be available to this way of uh, uh, confronting each other. When uh, the college was transferred to this location, this used to be this building, Used to used to be used to be the seat of the economic faculty of economics in Turin, and uh, um, I was a student at the Polytechnic, not at the university. I remember well. And I was walking by and I was looking up at it, and this is really one of the th Turin think tank think tanks here. We have uh, approximately 200 events each year. A lot, a lot of them, a good level. It's a way to transfer the results of research as carried out uh, in the college to the city, but also to the reference science communities. And if you think, you try and think of the festival on one side and the college as a think tank, you understand why this is uh, quite an important event. In addition to this, tonight we have quite a special event. An event is uh, the 20th lecture. Uh, we have a, a lecture, um, the Galliano lecture, Luca Galliano lecture. He was a Turin student who had a, a wonderful career ahead of him. But unfortunately, when he was 24, he had a car accident and he disappeared. And this is something that really struck people. And we had uh, this idea, an idea the value of which is probably more relevant than what it appears to remember, to celebrate this exceptional student with a topic of uh, economic value with a great interaction 
with activities that are outside our country because he had studied in the UK. So during this year, over these years, 20 years, this is the 20th lecture, um, we've had professors from the best universities in the world and Nobel Prize, as many of them also have become associated professors of the college. Maybe they stay here for longer periods and they interact with our researchers. So this activity to us, uh, it's a very important event. And tonight we have on uh, in line with what has been done in the past editions, Professor Halpin from Harvard University, who will talk about uh, offshoring, reshoring, and the future of international trade. I would give uh, the floor to a big uh, friend of the college who is Professor Thierry Verdier. Thank you, thank you to all of you, to both of you. Thank you very much. That's really a pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Helen and to this uh, 21st lecture of Luca D'Agliano on development economics. Um, it's also very difficult because many of you here probably in this room already know very much about Helena, but nevertheless, Helena is probably one of the most remarkable economists in the trade literature. If you go over his CV, you'll be very struck by, I denoted that there were something like 156 publications with more than 20 bo 22 books written or edited by him, and if you go over all the fields, all the topics, you realize that basically there's no topic in international economics that has not been touched by his, his mind and his prolific creativity. He has been at the origin of major advances in international trade. Uh, firstly, maybe that comes when he was young and he started to integrate uncertainty with international trade with uh, Azaf Rezin. And then, with two other men in international economics, Paul Krugman on one hand, and Jean Grossman on the other hand, he developed landmark uh, theories of international trade and the functioning of the international economy. First, with Paul Krugman, he uh, founded the new theory of international trade, which is about essentially showing that uh, countries which are similar in many aspects still do trade significantly with each other because of increasing returns to scale and monopolistic competition. That was a, ma a major advance at the time because for a long time economists fought international trade people that mostly trade was driven by comparative advantage theory. And at the same time, we were observing countries which are very similar in many aspects, trading significantly with each other. Secondly, with Jim Grossman, he developed the theory of growth and innovation in the global economy, basically integrating notions of industrial growth, technological change, innovation, dynamics of firms with R&D into the global economy. And then, after that, later, with a new generation of stellar trade economists, some of which are in this room, uh, actually, he went on contributing in many other aspects of international trade and economics. He developed things related to lobbying and political economy of public policies and trade policy, the organization and boundaries of the international firms, global sourcing with heterogeneity of firms, trade, labor and inequality, technology diffusion and trade, institutions and trade, now soft trade, and many and many many other things. Now you might say that's still a lot for one single man, but no, wait a minute, it goes even further than that because he also worked in areas that have nothing to do with international trade per se. He touched on exchange rate stabilization and macro programs, especially adapted for the Israeli economy, international debt and equity swaps, a very nice paper that I read when I was a student that was the moment when you had this big crisis, international trade in the 80s, 
and late, late the 80s and people wanted to get over the date that was happening in many developing countries. Uh, it went also on public economics, optimal taxation and welfare. Investment also in urban system infrastructures. And more recently, he wrote even papers on stuff which apparently had nothing to do with international trade, per se, like identity and trade policy. That seems to be very relevant to understand what happened during the Trump area in terms of trade policy, political support. And more recently, he even worked a small paper on fake news and their impact on electoral competition. So this is a very diversified, eclectic, mind that touches all the things that can happen and can be actually explained by economics one way or another. And let me finish with one very early French connection, and that is special to me. When I was still a French young student in Paris, in my engineering school, I was doing engineering. And then I tried to touch a bit on economics, and one of my mentors was Jean-Jacques Lafont was teaching at the time there general equilibrium theory. General equilibrium theory at the time was something very abstract about, you know, the functioning of competitive markets in very general setups. Something that basically only economists understood, but which apparently seems to be a very important reference point for the economic profession. And at the time, people were excited by introducing uncertainty and problems related you know, to complete markets and contingent markets and all the arrow types of structures. And Jean-Jacques Lafont, to try to motivate me to get into economics, told me to read a paper of his that he had written. The name of the paper was On Moral Hazard in General Equilibrium. And guess what? The co-author of that paper was Eleanor Heltman. And the paper was about something that I thought about it because it's somehow related to some of the stuff that maybe today Elanon will talk about, which was about a model in which you had firm, you had people, and economic agents, called them economic agents. Uh, they were basically facing a world with uncertainty, many states of nature could happen with some probabilities. But the one, the one thing that was important is that those probabilities were affected by the very action of the agents. And that could not be put into the contract of trying to protect them against risks. And the paper was about trying to show that there was an equilibrium and that the equilibrium was not efficient. At the time, of course, when I read the paper, I could not understand all the subtleties of what means, and here I, I'm sorry for the people who are not economists in the room, but Pareto efficiency and uh, fixed point existence theorems, but all the other people who are economists understand what I mean, which is a very sort of complicated stuff, but related to the fact that essentially, can we do better in the economy when you have risks and uncertainty? But here the risk and uncertainty was endogenous to the actions of the agents. And I was amazed by this paper, even if I didn't understand anything about it, but I was amazed about the paper because I realized that how, I could, how actually economists could grasp in a small framework something that was so complicated as risk, uncertainty for the social world. And that told me, you know, I could be an engineer constructing bridges and roads. That means more challenging to try to study social systems. So that's why I went to economics. And so in a sense, Elanon and my deceased mentor, Jean-Jacques Lafont, helped me in that way. Now, I thought about this paper as well, as I was saying, because today, uh, Helen and I will talk about things that relate a bit on this. Uncertainty, risk, exposure to production disruption, uh, resilience, diversification, but in a completely different context, of course, than general equilibrium theory with contingent markets so far, uh, which is about the, global, the, the, the organization of global value chains and, and their implications in this post-COVID and post or during Ukrainian war period. So now I leave the floor to uh, Helena and really we thank you very much for me here and sharing with us your reflections on all this. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for your kind introduction.
And uh, to the students, all I have to say is that if you live long enough and you go every day to the office and work all day long, you end up writing many papers. <laughs> it's not such a big thing. Okay, the, you know, for me, today's talk is a deviation from my academic uh, occupation. And it's sort of nice occasionally to deviate from the academic occupation and try to explain some things on a bigger scale. Uh, and then one can be a little bit loser and take uh, positions that one normally wouldn't take in an academic paper. So I want to talk about offshoring, reshoring, and the future of international trade because it seems to be in, uh, in danger. We are in a very risky period as far as international trade is concerned. But what's more important is the risk is not just for trade, but for the well-being of billions of people who benefit from the existing trading system. So I'll try to lay out what the issues are, and I'll make some comments, maybe not entirely justified by my academic work. So let me start with some background. So there has been a remarkable growth of world trade since World War II, and the ratio of trade to GDP has increased tremendously during this time. But this wasn't a continuous process. We know that essentially we had two big waves of globalization, one that started in the last quarter of the 19th century and the other which started after World War II. But between the two world wars, there was a decline in trade because of a variety of trade policies that country undertook. And I think we are a bit in a similar situation now. Uh, many countries are pursuing policies that can damage the world trading system. Uh, what has grown particularly fast is trade in uh, manufacturers uh, originally, but in more recent years, trade in services has also accelerated, and trade in services has become a very important component, and particularly business services. This is uh, the component that has been growing particularly fast. So just to give you an idea, in 21, the uh, exports in the world economy uh, account amounted to about $22 trillion. This is approximately the size of the U.S. economy. So we are talking about uh, a phenomena which is of the size of the U.S. economy. Uh, services at that time were already about $5 trillion, and they were extremely small uh, earlier on. So as you probably know, leading exporters or traders are China, US, Germany, and Japan. And uh, China has become a bigger trader than the US. It was a smaller one most of the time. And there are sort of sizable differences in trade to GDP ratios. Uh, the richest countries trade the most, the poorest countries the least, and the other countries uh, somewhere in, in between. So this is a, a, a chart that describes the evolution of world trade. Uh, it, here it counts exports plus imports, so sort of there's some doubling of, of the volume. Uh, and it comes from an IMF paper that has a very long list of, uh, of authors. Uh, they start in 1870, which is already when trade picks up. If you go back to the early part of the 19th century, trade was ba basically negligible, world trade. But what you see here is the first wave of globalization going up until World War I. Then there is a decline relative to GDP. And then after World War II, we have the acceleration that I talked about earlier. And, and a particularly fast acceleration starts in the 1980s. And then since the financial crisis, it's approximately constant. But the important thing to note here is that despite the gloom and doom that we read in the newspapers, there hasn't been a collapse of trade. It, it didn't continue to grow, but it remained approximately constant. Uh, 
It went back after the financial crisis to where it was before. Then we had the COVID crisis. It went down and went up again and so on. But I think that we are now in a situation in which there is real danger that it will decline in the future. And this is primarily because of policies that different countries pursue. Without going into more detail, look at this uh, chart, which shows you essentially the correlation between openness and growth. And this is a very difficult correlation generally to interpret, but it's hard to avoid the conclusion that countries that don't trade uh, can grow very fast. It can happen occasionally, but broadly speaking, growth of countries is co highly correlated with, uh, with trade. And I leave it at here, uh, because I'm not going to talk much about it. Uh, I just want you to bear it in mind that trade is important for the well-being of people who live in countries that engage in foreign trade. One particular component of trade is important, and this is trade in intermediate inputs. We, uh, intermediate inputs account for uh, more than two-thirds of world trade. And a lot of the evolution of the global value chains is, of course, related to trade in intermediate inputs. The World Bank, in time, the year 2000, published a report uh, which was focused on this particular phenomenon. And this chart comes from this report, and it shows you the growth of trade in, in, essentially along the global value chains. Uh, so what this counts is you look at products or the value of a product that crosses borders more than once, and you count how, you know, how, how much value there is of products of this type relative to the overall trade. And you see this fast rise, about half of trade uh, has been uh, of this particular type. So obviously, trade in intermediate inputs is important. We have theories which explain why it's important. We have empirical studies showing that they bring about productivity improvements and they increase uh, gross domestic products. Just to understand how integrated the world is, this is again a, a figure from the uh, World Bank report. Just look at a simple product like a bicycle, and what you see is that saddles are mostly exported by China and some by Italy. And the frames are exported by China big time. And then Vietnam and Italy breaks, Japan, Singapore, and some in Malaysia, and so on. So you look at a simple product, and this product has, doesn't have that many parts, but some of the key parts come from different countries, and then eventually they are assembled into a bicycle, wherever they are assembled. I like this one very much. It comes from a McKinsey report, which compared two uh, manufacturers of computer, Dell and uh, Lenovo. So what we have here is a count of suppliers, what they call tier one and tier two suppliers, namely the suppliers of the computer company and the suppliers of the suppliers. Okay, and they didn't go further because you can go to the suppliers of the suppliers of the suppliers, and so on. Paul Antras is here. He likes to explain this chain uh, ad infinitum. OK. So what you see here is that Dell uh, had, oops, sorry. Dell had close to 5,000 suppliers, uh, tier one plus two, which were not suppliers of Lenovo. And Lenovo had close to 4,000 suppliers, tier one and two, which were not suppliers of Dell. So they are sort of specialized to these particular companies. And then there is some sharing, by a little over 2,000 of them. But the point is that these companies have a huge number of suppliers. 
And, you know, a laptop is not such a complicated product anymore. Yes, it has complicated parts, but as a product, it's not terribly complicated. So the point is that there is a lot of dependence of final good producers on intermediate good producers, and the intermediate good producers also depend on other intermediate good producers and so on. And this generates a very complex and interrelated world trading system from which all of us benefit. In this report by the World Bank, they also provide a map of regions that are involved in these global supply chains. And uh, what you see here is that some regions, like North America, uh, is involved in what they call innovative activities. Uh, others, like Australia, have limited commodities and so on. So the point is the following. Many regions of the world are involved in these relationships but A, to a different degree, and B, a, a different type of products in terms of sophistication and its location, essentially, uh, in this chain. So what are properties of, of this, uh, th these chains? So we, we know that there are some inputs that you can buy on an anonymous market, but in the sophisticated products, like the Dell uh, or the, the Lenovo, these are highly specialized inputs, and the, the transactions are done along these uh, supply chains, uh, and sometimes we refer to them as re relational uh, transactions. So the, uh, I won't go into the details because uh, we, we don't have that much time, but you understand that this involves particular relationships between the buyers and suppliers. And, and, and during this festival, there are other talks on these issues, and I don't need to elaborate on it. So we know that this was enabled by the fragmentation of production that was the consequence of the IT revolution, essentially. And this is also well known. This has been many times discussed in the past. And what is important is that it requires a matching of compatible partners. And this means that if you are a final good producer or even an intermediate good producer and you need to buy parts, you have to find a partner that will produce these parts because the specification may be too complicated for most other producers. So this requires matching, it requires search, and this involves costs which are evaluated to be quite high. And this sometimes also requires investments uh, on both sides in order to be able to cooperate. And never, as a result, actually, what happens is that although in many cases there are no long-term contracts, the relationships survive nevertheless. So there's some stickiness in these relationships because if you are to leave a supplier say, you have to find another one, and this happens to be quite costly. And of course, it involves risk. Suppliers sometimes are not able to supply the goods. Uh, sometimes the part will not be proper, and so on. But the point I want to emphasize now, because I'll come back to it later, is that Companies live with this risk constantly, which means that they develop strategies to deal with the risk. And if you try to improve on their strategies, you have to sort of understand what is it that they do and whether you can actually des design anything that will improve on what they are doing. So I think that this is a very important point to which I will come later. So there have, 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 been, there ha have been many disruptions in supply chains. COVID-19 brought to our attention uh, this phenomena, but it existed long before in different uh, degrees. So the Japanese earthquake of 2021 uh, was all over the news. It had a big impact, a big negative impact. There was the floods in Thailand in 2011, 
And what happened there is it hit particularly badly the Japanese car producers. And there are estimates uh, how badly it is. Some of them are more reliable than others, but the, the key point is that a flood in one country or an er earthquake have consequences beyond the borders of the country. And then there were sort of simpler shocks to the system, like the evergreen vessel that blocked the Suez Canal in 2021, and uh, shortages of semiconductors. We became aware of it during the pandemic because at that time there was a shift in demand away from services to goods, and this increased the demand for semiconductors, and the shortage uh, developed. I think that uh, semiconductors are an interesting case because we will talk about U.S. policy towards China in terms of technology, but the U.S. had a very different policy towards the Soviet Union in the 1960s when the semiconductors came on the scene and they were developed. Completely different policy. And the, the, the shortage is still real. I bought a car in uh, March and it was delivered with one key. But why? They don't have enough chips for a second key. So I'm still waiting to get the second key for the car. Okay. So th these are the type of little shortages that are unimaginable, but uh, they exist. And then the, during the pandemic, there was a host of shortages uh, of uh, different types. Okay, so one point that I made already, but I want to make it more forcefully now, is that business firms li live with these disruptions, and therefore they develop strategies to handle them. And this, again, comes from a study by McKinsey, which uh, shows it's a small sample, so it's not terribly reliable, but it's sort of illustrative. So in their sample, what you see is that an average company suffers one to two weeks of disruption every two years, once in two years, uh, two to four weeks uh, once every three years or so, uh, one to two months every four years. This is quite a lot, right? And even more than two months, like every five years. So there, there are these disruptions that the companies reported to McKinsey uh, that are quite common. There is nothing unusual about it, and obviously they have to do something about it. How costly are these disruptions? Again, from the same study, what you see is that there is variation across different sectors in the economy. The average disruption is 42% of annual earnings, net earnings, over a 10-year period. So it's really not negligible, it's quite substantial. And in some sectors, it's, you see, like uh, automotive sector is more than 50%. And in others, obviously, like pharmaceutical, it's much smaller, it's about 24%. But the average is 42% of annual earnings over a 10-year period. So th this is obviously quite costly, and companies just cannot disregard it. They have to take it into account. Now, trade policy changed dramatically during the Trump uh, administration, and we still live with uh, its consequences. So, until 2018, uh, this, the structure of protection was that final products typically had higher tariffs than intermediate inputs. Uh, so, for example, in the G20 countries, the difference was something between 70 and 75 percent, namely tariffs on final goods were 70 to 75 percent higher than tariffs on intermediate inputs. In the U.S., the difference was huge. Tariffs on final goods were about four times as high as tariffs on intermediate inputs. If we had time, I would go back to the 1960s when there was a debate about development uh, and many countries engaged in import substitution policies and this question of whether you 
protect intermediate inputs or final goods was a big issue uh, that led to lots of calculations of what we call effective rates of protection, and eventually this, these policies were abandoned in, in these countries. But uh, there was a country like Australia, for example, that had huge rates of effective protection despite the, the regular tariffs, they didn't look so terrible because they imposed many on intermediate inputs. So this per se, it's already known that it's a bad thing economically. It has bad consequences. But this is uh, what has happened. So with uh, Trump's tariff, was imposed mostly on intermediate inputs, and by September 2018, 82% uh, of intermediate imported from China were covered by these tariffs, but only about 29% uh, of, of final consumer goods. And uh, under the phase, what's known as the phase one deal, 93% of intermediates covered by special tariffs. This deal was designed actually to try to reduce the, deficit, the trade deficit between the US and China, but the trade deficit didn't really budge. Uh, so, you know, the tariffs came in and the trade deficit said hello and stayed where it was. So if you look at the evolution of uh, US tariffs during this period, you see the red curve describes tariffs on final goods and the blue one on intermediate inputs. Until the time Trump tariffs, the final goods were taxed at a higher rate. Then both went up, but what went up particularly are the tariffs on intermediate goods. And the other point which is sort of interesting is uh, in 2021, there was a, sh a change in American administration. On January 20, President Biden was sworn in. And what, the, what was the first thing he did? Just a month later, he issued this executive order, uh, which says that the United States needs resilient, diverse, secure supply chains to ensure our economic prosperity and national security. And it went on and on. And the last sentence here from the document says, resilient American supply chains will revitalize and rebuild domestic manufacturing capacity, maintain America's competitive edge in research and development, and create well-paying jobs. Great promises. And this policy has evolved over time, essentially. Curiously, he didn't touch the Trump tariffs. They just stayed. And in fact, they made it, made it worse by imposing some export restraints, which made the situation worse than it was before. But I want to elaborate a little bit on this uh, by citing from a speech by by Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen uh, last April. I won't read all of it to you, but the sort of interesting thing here is that she explicitly says the US government's action can come in the form of export controls. So this is a new layer of, of protection. And of course, uh, we also carefully review foreign investment in the United States for national security. And this term national security features very dominantly in many of the documents related to the formation of the of US trade policy. And uh, also on outbound investment. And she said, we have mounted a historic expansion of American semiconductor manufacturing through CHIPS and Science Act, and we are making our nation's largest investment in clean energy, uh, energy with the Inflation Reduction uh, Act. The Inflation Reduction Act, uh, Act contains uh, an important provision about the manufacturing of electric cars, and the US had a big dispute with Europe about it, 
And uh, because it was a piece of legislature, it was difficult to overcome it. And then they found some strange out, uh, outfit, which is if you lease a car, rather than buy it, it doesn't fall under the act. And there was a huge increase in, 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 le in leases in the United States as a result. This is quite typical, by the way, when you use some trade policy, uh, companies, people try to find some way around it. But in this case, the government was really willing to find a way around it because they realized ex post that it, maybe it wasn't such a great idea. And she continues that the top priority for President Biden is the resilience of our critical supply chains. This was the statement before. And she repeats a term that came into the lexicon quite recently, and this is called friendshoring. So you try to shift production from hostile countries to friendly countries. And this is what friendshoring is about. Okay, so what has happened over time during this period? So this is an interesting chart which shows uh, the, how many trade restrictions were imposed on trade in goods, on investment, and trade in services. And what you see is uh, starting with the financial crisis, there was some creeping increase initially, but then during the Trump administration, it shoots up. And this is not just in the US, this is in many countries. I mean, these numbers uh, accumulate across many countries. So the biggest shift is in goods and in services, essentially. But more recently, we see it also as far as uh, investment is concerned. The other thing uh, worth noting is that in the business discussion, uh, in business presentations, these terms of reshoring, onshoring, and nearshoring show up much more than they did in the past. And you see this rapid rise. Uh, the biggest increase, as you can see, is in, in the discussion of onshoring and nearshoring. French shoring is also prominent uh, more recently. So we, we see this shoot up of uh, protection in different forms. And we see at least in terms of discussion, the discussion uh, of how to change from, uh, from producing in some countries. Some countries essentially miss China and shift the production to other countries. These are explicit government policies uh, reasoning. So I already mentioned that discriminatory tariffs on intermediate inputs are particularly harmful. And uh, this is true, especially along the supply chains when there is costly search for uh, suppliers that need to match with the, with the buyers. And the Trump tariff led to a reallocation of production away from China. Now, most of this relocation was to other low-cost uh, Asian countries, like Mal Malaysia, Indonesia, and Vietnam is a big winner of it. There are about 13 countries which absorbed most of this reshuffling. But there has been also some reshuffling to other countries. And there has been relatively little reshuffling back to the United States. So the, the, this means that the buyers were looking for cheap suppliers in countries that can essentially produce the products that they need. Uh, you can sit here, it's mine. Sorry, sorry. Oh, it's okay. Yeah, it's Okay, so in some work that I did with uh, Gene Grossman and Steve Redding, we have developed an analytical framework to assess this phenomena, and we provide an estimate 
which is, uh, you know, it's not very tight, but it's a number. And the number is that this brought about a loss of about 3% of revenue in uh, American manufacturing. As far as straight policy is concerned, this is a pretty large number because this, uh, this uh, number falls on the gross uh, revenue of the, of, the, of the industry. But what I find particularly interesting is that there is a lot of discussion that I mentioned already before, and it sort of continues, of trying to diversify. Now, what does diversification mean? I didn't uh, read the citation from Janet Yellen's speech, but she explicitly states that this is the policy, to try to convince companies to diversify to many other countries. Now, the problem with this policy is the following. As we have seen, companies are aware of the riskiness, and they already diversify to some degree. And the question is, why does the government want to diversify more? Is there a good justification for this? So if there is a true social security argument, then this is, will be a type of industrial policy that economists will typically support. And essentially what we typically say in these situations is if there is some externality involved that the companies don't internalize, the government should step in and try to correct it if it knows what this externality is. But in this area, we really don't, know, don't have that much knowledge. Our knowledge as a profession is quite limited. And the question is then, how to advise the government in, in pursuing these policies? Now, as far as I know, many people would, uh, that I know that know something about the subject, they don't advise the government. So I don't know who is providing the advice. Uh, so th this is a sort of real problem. And the big other question is, uh, if uh, as a result of these policies, these supply chains break up, what will be the consequences? So we don't know for sure, but there are some estimates. So this is an estimate uh, that was done by some German economists that looks at two, uh, two scenarios. One is that the U.S. essentially withdraws from all the foreign supply chains. This is obviously a very extreme scenario. And the other is that it withdraws from supply chains from China only. So the, the former is the black, and the scale that you should look at is at the top. And the latter is the red, are the red bars, and the relevant scale is at the bottom. So if the U.S. were to withdraw completely, according to this estimate, then Canada will be badly hit. It will lose about 3.5% of its welfare, the way it's measured. The U.S. will be the next more than 2% loss, and Mexico will also lose, and then other countries lose also, but these three are the biggest losses. Why these three? Because, as you know, they are combined into a North American free trade agreement, and they are linked with each other uh, very tightly. If the U.S. were to withdraw from supply chains to China only, you look at the red ones, then the bigger, big loser will be China, obviously. Uh, and the U.S. will lose also substantially. The other countries a little less, and Mexico ex actually comes out ahead because what happens is that the supply chains withdrawn from China would, to some a large degree, be being, will be shifted by the U.S. to Mexico. So this brings uh, Mexico uh, out ahead. But the point is that the, if you believe these numbers, that the losses are substantial. Yes? Uh, and again, all these estimates are somewhat iffy, but uh, 
there are ways in which they are calculated. You have to sort of understand the way they are calculated and form your confidence interval around them on your own, because typically no confidence intervals uh, are, are supplied. OK, so what do I sort of conclude from this? So my, my view is that the world economy is facing large risks as a result of, uh, of the retreat from the liberal rule-based uh, system. And I want to emphasize the rule-based order, because this is really what, what at stake here. You probably are aware of the fact that the WTO is not functioning very well uh, recently. Uh, it doesn't have teeth to uh, implement the rules that uh, exist. And there is need for a revision, uh, which is not my uh, topic here, but there's somebody else I see at the last row. He will be talking about it. Uh, then, the other part of the danger is the spread of uncoordinated industrial and trade policies. We hear now a lot about industrial policies. So again, as far as social security is concerned, if this is a narrowly focused policy that can be justified on national security grounds, it's hard to argue with it. But the problem is that I'm not sure that this is really at stake. And what might happen is that the world be, will be split into trading clubs with little relationship between them. And this will bring a lot of damage to the countries involved. I'm not sure that it will bring a lot of positive uh, uh, response to the politicians that implement it, but maybe by then they won't, won't be in politics anymore, yes? It's like Brexit, yes, the people who led Brexit, uh, they are not there anymore and everybody else has to bear the cost. <laughs> now, there is some sense that the rhetorics concerning economic policies uh, really are designed to just disguise protectionist tendencies. This is also not unusual. It happened in the past. For example, when Japan became powerful and the US worried about, about Japan, there was a somewhat similar situation. Now, there are issues with China. I don't want to discount them. And one should deal with these issues. But we don't want to spread around protection just because there are issues with China. And we don't want to bring out a collapse of the world trading system as a result. And we don't want to have a system in which there is a US club, a China club, a Brazilian club, and so on. This would be very bad for the world economy and essentially for the people in the world economy. Uh, to summarize the point that I made before, uh, you know, the global value chains may not be fully efficient, uh, but there is not enough information on how to design good policies. So maybe one way to proceed is for more economists try to figure out what will be good policies. This requires to conceptualize first of all, and second, to do empirical studies that will provide some estimates, and these estimates will guide the policy formation. Without it, we are basically throwing in the dark, and many countries do it now. It's very fashionable, and I find this to be uh, very damaging. And if we look at the existing estimates, we see that the coupling of one type of the other is actually quite uh, damaging. Again, we need better estimates, but we also need better frameworks to deal with these issues. 
And the final point I want to make, which is an obvious point, and, and this is to avoid this fragmentation of the world economy into clubs that will compete with each other rather than uh, cooperate, I think it's time to try to promote cooperation in policy formation. Both in security, on security issues, uh, industrial policy and trade policies, and maybe to bring back the WTO into the fold with a better design. Thank you very much. We're going to take questions now and reactions. Joel and then. I wonder, Elchheim, if you could comment on one other thing that you barely mentioned, and that is that not only that trade policy has been harnessed for national security, but it's also been used as a tool for foreign policy. And, you know, the last 20 years, I don't want to tell you, the United States, but other countries as well, have used economic sanctions as a tool against countries that for some reason or another we don't like. So this is like, almost like a substitute for hot warfare. And it isn't just China, of course, it's countries like Iran, North Korea, Venezuela, and so on and so forth. And in a way, that's compounding the things that you've been talking about, isn't it? Yeah, it does. Uh, but I, I, I'm not aware about estimates which say that, uh, that these are extremely harmful to the world economy. I'm sure they are harmful to these countries and to the United States, but I don't know what the magnitude of this are. Yeah, I mean, look, trade policy has been used as foreign policy over many, uh, over a long, uh, a long time. It's, it's not uh, something new. What is new is uh, the aggressive use of industrial policy, actually. This is new. The, I mean, there, have, there were countries in the past who did it, but we are talking about, about the US and we are talking about Europe. And these two big players on the world scene are using aggressively industrial policy. And uh, we should be worried about it. They need to coordinate their policies, I think, including their trade policies. They should bring other countries into the fold. And as I said, they should bring the WTO back into default and try to uh, change the rules to meet the new challenges. The, I mean, this is easier said than done, but it's absolutely necessary to do it because otherwise we are on a very slippery road. This is my view. Giorgio. Lahanan, thank you for a wonderful lecture. Uh, I think that uh, it was really great. Uh, it was really great lecture, and it's fantastic to have you here within the framework of the festival because there are so many other great scholars in this room that it's really fantastic. So, just so thank you very much. Really, just two short questions. The first one is whether you think that uh, reshoring will somehow self-feed into more protectionist policies in the sense Absolutely. that the reactions, the fact that we are reshoring, then we don't need to import intermediates anymore, and then this will generate even more protectionist policies. The second one is whether you think that essentially the weakness, the weakening of the multilateral architecture of the WTO started with all the free trade and regional agreements that uh, boosted enormously after the Uruguay round, and now we have more than 350, I think, regional agreements. Do you think that those agreements started creating clubs, the clubs you were mentioning, is the roots, or the, the, the rebirth of these clubs is there? Yes, I, I think that reshoring is just another way to, I mean, it's not re, uh, reshoring by the companies that choose to do it, but government policies that encourage reshoring are, are protectionist policies, like, uh, yeah. Now, about the, I, I'm, not, I, I don't, I'm not sure that I have a view uh, on, the, on your second questions. I would say 
probably that this was not a trigger. The trigger uh, was probably the shift in the geopolitics. And, uh, you know, uh, the WTO has uh, a few hundred, I, I don't remember the number, but it's more than 400 uh, uh, trade agreements that it approved. It's a large number. Uh, this was a substitute for uh, multilateral uh, negotiations since, uh, 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 since 1994. There hasn't been much progress on this front. Uh, so th this was in, to some degree a substitute. Uh, maybe it contributed to this trend, but I, my guess is that probably not. But the shift in the geopolitics uh, is the, the main culprit. And it's, it's sort of obvious that China has become much more powerful and uh, the disagreement between China and the US are severe. And there is real competition. Uh, the competition is not just about economics. The competition is also about control of regions. So this, this is, again, it's not unusual. It happens. And the question is whether it's possible to find a way to solve these issues uh, with agreement rather with competition, with a trade war. A trade war can lead to a worse trade war. It can lead to other consequences far beyond uh, trade wars. The tariff wars between the war, the World War I and World War II are a good example of how it brought about the contraction of trade. And it's quite possible that we will see something similar now. If, if this combination of uncoordinated trade policies and industrial policies continues, this is what we can expect to happen. We, we have two more questions, one here first and then one over there. Two, two brief questions, actually. One is many people predicted that uh, Europe will not be able to decouple uh, from Russia unless there is some type of mass mm -hmm. unemployment. I was wondering if this episode kind of informs your beliefs as well. And the second question, what is your sense of the mean variance trade-off uh, between resilience and how much trade we have to sacrifice? Well, the, ans the answer on the second question is that I don't know. Uh, and also, I mean, again, I mean, the, the, ba the, the main issue is that companies already do it to some degree. And the question is whether the government can shift the trade-off in into a better place. And I'm not convinced that it can. From the analytical work that exists, uh, there is no, no obvious uh, num uh, uh, answer, and there are no estimates that will really help, help to support it. Now, you know, the, the, the coupling of Europe from, from Russia, I think it's a good example. Joel Mokir wrote a lot about it in, in history, that countries and societies adjust. And the, it, it's sort of wrong to take uh, a view that at this moment, the dependence of one country on the other is to some degree, and that this will be the ultimate determinant of what happens if they decouple. The countries adjust, and there is a lot of flexibility. So this is historically true, and I think it will be true also in the future. Uh, but we really need much better estimates of this phenomenon. One more question. Yes. Thank you for the very nice uh, lecture. Uh, my question is, uh, trade had many enemies in the past, but they came once at a time. This time, it seems that you have many enemies coming at the same time. On the right wing, you have more concern about national security. On the left wing, you have concerns about green transition, needs to protect work. Don't you think that this concentration of enemies from right to left, center, could be more detrimental this time? It might be. So I think it's, 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 it is a geopolitical issue to a large degree that, you know, it's not, just an, it's not just an economic issue. But the interesting thing is, if you look at uh, surveys of people's attitude, in the US, for example, yes, it's still the case that the majority of people surveyed uh, 
are in favor of international economic relations. It went down somewhat, but uh, you know, it's still, I don't remember the number, but it's something like 60%. So uh, the point is that if you sort of dig deeper into this, uh, people are in favor of international economic relations, but then when it comes to the nitty gritty, what type of relationships, uh, they become quite sensitive uh, because they have views about how other people are affected, how they are affected, and uh, there's a combination of things. I, don't, uh, I know that Stephanie Stancheva talked about it here, so it's actually good to read her paper. It covers a lot of ground on these issues. One question, and the last question at the back over there. Good evening. Uh, thank you for your lecture. Uh, I have one question regarding reshoring, to be exact. Um, what do you think in the future uh, countries will rely more on reshoring or nearshoring? Like, for example, Canada and the US on Mexico and uh, European countries in the Eastern Europe, Balkan countries. What is your opinion? What is going to be more relevant in the future, nearshoring or reshoring? Thank you. I don't know. I don't... I don't know the answer to this question, yes. It's, uh, you know, the answer I can give you is if you tell me, you know, what the governments will decide to do, it's like if Canada, the US, and Mexico decide to promote a certain type of policy, this obviously will have an effect. Uh, but otherwise, I, I just don't have answers to questions like this. We don't have good estimates, we don't have good models of this, and uh, we have to go back to the office and work for <laughs> maybe for longer hours to try to understand what's happening. I don't know if I can work longer hours, but you know, everybody else maybe. <laughs> Thank you very much, Renan.